Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. In today's episode, we're jumping back into mainline Chinese history, moving the conversation back to central politics to talk about the social, political, and economic plans of the CCP from 1953 onwards. Today, we're going to be discussing the first five-year plan specifically, what it was and how it was supposed to work, how did it end up working in the end, and what were the results for the country. But before we get into the episode, first the regular announcements. You can go to the Sinobabble website to sign up for email updates, letting you know whenever a new episode is released, usually a day earlier on the website than on other podcast players, and also linking you to some interesting reading on China that I've come across recently. Also, you can now support the podcast by going to the website, clicking on the donate button, and making either a single or monthly donation of any amount of your choice. Now back to the episode. So today we're talking about China's very first five-year plan. To give a brief description of what that actually means, a five-year plan is a form of centralised economic planning designed to effectively run and grow the national economy based on socialist theory and usually requiring high levels of political and social mobilisation. This particular form of economic planning originated in the Soviet Union and was used by many other socialist nations to organise their economies, and is actually still used in China today. They're currently on their 14th five-year plan as of 2020, though it looks very, very different to the first one, for obvious reasons. The major questions we'll be attempting to answer today are, where did this dedication to a singular model of economic development begin? What did the first plan look like? And what were the effects on the Chinese economy and society? Let's start by recapping the state of the Chinese economy up until 1953, just to give some context to the introduction of the Grand Project. From 1949 to 1952, the CCP had effectively established their rule over China, gaining control over the central government as well as the economy, bringing the peripheries back under centralised rule, and stamping out any resistance they might meet from the landlord or capitalist classes through a series of political campaigns. With the legitimacy of their regime no longer in question, it was time to start rebuilding the country after decades of chaos and devastation, starting with the transformation of the modes of industrial and agricultural production into socialist processes. Under the influence of the Soviet Union, as we discussed a few episodes ago, China was moving steadily towards a form of development that would make its economy less reliant on Western influence and more self-reliant, interacting mainly with other socialist nations. The CCP, and particularly Mao, wanted to get on with the process right away, but had to take into account the context of the Chinese economy, as well as the state of society as a whole. In the mid-20th century, China's economy was straddling two worlds. While there were some strong capitalist bases, especially in coastal cities such as Shanghai, Tianjin and Qingdao, that benefited greatly from the presence of foreign businesses and capital, The majority of the country was still stuck in a pre-modern, pre-industrial state, where the majority of people worked in subsistence agriculture, or where there was industry, it was usually small-scale handicraft manufacturing. The two worlds were also completely separate from one another. The urban elites in the country's coastal urban areas were highly educated, sometimes in foreign universities, wealthy, technically savvy for the time, and used to mod cons such as electricity, running water, and entertainment facilities such as shopping malls and cinemas. The people of China's interior, however, mostly lived in abject poverty, rates of illiteracy were high, and modern conveniences were few and very far between. The only sustained growth the country had seen in the 20th century was the growth in population, which left China caught in a Malthusian trap whereby the amount of surplus agricultural produce available was severely restricted by the amount of arable land available compared to the population size. Basically, China's economy had next to nothing to build on, apart from some industrial base in Manchuria that had been installed by the Japanese, and mainly light industry that flourished in rich urban coastal areas. So the aim of the five-year plan was to turn the economy around and make China into a modern industrialised nation with an egalitarian social structure. The model for China's first five-year plan was based on the work of two Soviet economists, Grigory Feldman and Yevgeny Preobrajensky. I'm just going to pretend that I said that correctly. To understand the theories of these two economists, we first have to understand how the economy was visualised by socialist planners, 
Essentially, in order to ensure growth, the planned economy had to produce a surplus in order to expand the means of production, which is known as accumulation. Accumulation depended on the relationships between two major parts of the economy, agriculture and industry. Within this concept of accumulation, industry was further subdivided into two parts, heavy industry, which produces equipment for industrial expansion, and agricultural industry, which manufactures the means of production for agriculture. Feldman's theory was that you had to invest more in industrial production than in agriculture if you wanted the economy to grow. This higher level of investment would mean that the subfields of industry, heavy and agricultural industries, would also expand, meaning that agriculture in general would become more efficient because more and better agricultural tools would be developed by industry, leading to greater yields and therefore greater surplus. This surplus in agriculture would include key raw materials such as oil and cotton, which could then be reinvested as raw materials into the industrial sector, and also grain, which would then be used to feed the growing industrial workforce. So basically just see it as this big loop. Investment in industry means growth in everything else. Feldman's model was supported by Preobrajensky's own views, which not only advocated for the transference of agricultural surplus to industry, but also recommended that the central planning authorities keep prices of agricultural goods artificially low to allow for greater appropriation and a speedier transformation to socialism. Though it originated in the Soviet Union, this approach actually caused a lot of debate there, with some politicians such as Bukharin arguing for at least the equal development of agriculture, if not the prioritisation of agriculture altogether. But no such debate was had in China, who were enamoured with the theory and the results that they had seen in the Soviet Union since the 1940s and 1950s, which by this point in time meant that the Soviet Union actually had the most advanced blast furnaces in the world. The Chinese also had the benefit of hindsight. Mao may not have liked the forceful nature of development in the USSR, which saw many Russians exiled to gulags and Siberia, which also alienated large swaths of the peasantry, but the results were evident and measures could be taken to prevent resistance from below. By the way, I am aware that other sectors of the economy existed in China and also exist in general, but they were not at the centre of the five-year plan at all to the extent that they were not even mentioned as far as I can tell. Anything that was being developed, like the banking industry or science and technology, even the art industry, they were all basically oriented towards the central sectors of industry and agriculture, but mainly industry. This was partly because everything was state-owned by the 1950s anyway, so any growth or knowledge was just reabsorbed by the state and reinvested into these sectors. Or it was because the workers in these industries were literally just made to work for the five-year plan, even if that was indirectly. My PhD thesis is actually all about how all artists in the 1950s were co-opted into making propaganda art for the promotion of economic and political campaigns, including the five-year plan and the Great Leap Forward, but I will talk about that later on in the series. So anyway... China wanted to go Soviet, however, there was a core issue with China's adoption of the Soviet model, namely that of development. While the USSR had managed to pull off the proper communist revolution, with a large working class proletariat led by the party as vanguard, the majority of the Chinese revolution base were peasants, who also made up four-fifths of the population. To give some ideas as to the differences between the two nations at the time of their revolution, In 1928, the Soviet Union had a population of around 150 million, 19% of whom lived in urban areas, with a gross national product per capita of around 240 US dollars. China, in 1952, had a population of just over half a billion, only 12% of whom lived in urban areas, and a gross national product per capita of only 50 US dollars, around 20% of the Soviet Union's. Differences in industrial output are also stark, with the Soviet Union's per capita coal and steel production standing at 241 kilograms and 28 kilograms, compared to China's measly 111 kilograms and 2.3 kilograms. Basically, China was poor and had no industry or any industrial workers to speak of. China's cultivated land per capita was also much lower than that of the USSR's, 
meaning that there was little, if any, surplus to be had to put into the non-existent industrial sector. In response to these challenges, the CCP decided to take a more ideological approach to the idea of rapid industrialization. They may not have had a strong industrial base like the Soviets, but one thing they did have on them was a strong political foundation in the countryside. The process of agricultural collectivization had been much smoother in China than it had been in the USSR, where it had actually been very brutal and bloody and not good at all. Further, as discussed in previous episodes, the land reform campaign, as well as the three anti and five anti campaigns carried out in urban areas, were actually carried out to lay the foundation for the five year plan. The radical redistribution of land during land reform had won many peasants on side and had scared most landlords away from retaliation or from speaking out against the party. So, despite the lack of material wealth, the CCP was determined to make the plan a success based on sheer willpower alone. This will be a recurring theme throughout the series, by the way, with mixed results, so just take note of that fact. Before the five-year plan was officially launched, two central bureaus in charge of running the show were established, the State Statistical Bureau and the State Planning Commission. There were also seven new ministries set up, each to control a specific area of the economy and production, being the ministries of foreign trade, domestic trade, heavy industry, light industry, geology, food and engineering, and construction. I don't know why food and engineering are one department, but whatever. Overall focus was to be put on heavy industry, with the explicit subordination of agriculture to the needs of industrial development. In industry, there were 694 major projects to be undertaken as part of the plan, with 156 carried out with Soviet assistance. All new factories were to be built near deposits of natural resources and wage inflation was to be kept below productivity and capital growth to ensure the continued expansion of industrial production. In agriculture, the main focus was to be put on creating a surplus of raw materials as well as grain, which would be then invested back into industry. The majority of general investment from the government was put into industry, with only 8% allocated to agriculture. The majority of industrial projects were large-scale and capital-intensive, with 90% of all investment being put into metallurgy, machine building, electronic power, coal, petroleum and chemical industries. Also just a note, during this period the process of socialisation of all industries was also completed. Most enterprises were allowed to continue operating either as private businesses or as joint state-owned enterprises until the mid-1950s, But by 1954, the speed of the transfer process was increased, and by 1956, the transformation of all private businesses into state-owned companies was completed in every industry, which allowed for greater control from a centralised planning perspective. So basically, if you had owned a private factory in the past, it was now a state-owned enterprise, or SOE. The Chinese leaned on the Soviets heavily for advice and support during this period, and when I say heavily, I mean heavily. Apart from shipping in literally entire factories to be built from scratch in China, the Soviet Union sent between 10 and 20,000 advisors to teach the Chinese how the machinery worked, to give them blueprints and help them work out production quotas, and even stay in some factories to act as overseers and to teach managerial techniques. The Chinese followed their advice basically to the letter. Everything was vertically organised, from the seven centralised ministries down to the management at factory level. It was seriously an OCD type A dream world, where every number from production quotas to work team sizes to salaries was decided at a central level and then just passed down to be enacted by the requisite factory. The distribution of products and allocation of resources was also decided at a central level and were based on targets and objectives rather than market value or price fluctuation. Basically, there was no free trade or exchange market operational at this time. Anything that was produced was reported to the centre, and then the centre decided where the produced goods would go from there. One of the most important aspects of this plan being carried out successfully was the training of personnel. Around 80,000 Chinese engineers, technicians and researchers went to the USSR to study Soviet methodology in factories and in training facilities. Though the party would have liked the top ranks of the new state-owned enterprises to be staffed with loyal communists and those from working-class backgrounds, by 1953, China still had a class problem, despite all the campaigns and ideological education work that had taken place in the preceding four years. 
Essentially, all of China's university graduates in 1949 were from middle or upper middle class backgrounds. And about 63% of these graduates had degrees in subjects such as engineering, sciences, economics and business, all of which were necessary skills for industrialization. So in 1953, when the first five-year plan was to be launched, around 80% of managerial personnel were made up of the bourgeoisie, while the remaining 20% were the Communist Party members, who were also to be responsible for the ideological direction of the campaign. A lot of this campaign also focused on developing regions in the interior, central part of China, as well as the West. And before we just move on to talk about agriculture, I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the reasons why the CCP were so intent on developing these interior regions. Besides the obvious reasons of having a balanced and stable economy, as well as a happy, cooperative population that supports the government wholeheartedly. So if you cast your mind back to the episodes on the 1930s, you remember that the CCP spent a lot of time in the countryside, particularly in the underdeveloped regions in northwest China, and had experienced for themselves the poor conditions and abject poverty the majority of the Chinese people lived in. On top of that, Mao and many of the CCP leaders were themselves from poor rural areas, and many still had a chip on their shoulder about not being urban or cultured enough, which we discussed in the episode on Mao, where he went to Beijing but was never really part of those elite socialist circles at Beijing University. So part of the CCP's developmental policy was some genuine desire to alleviate poverty due to their own prior experiences, and another part of it was probably a feeling of animosity, or at least standoffishness, towards the urban elite, who they viewed as just a class of elitist bourgeoisie that not only looked down on them, but would try and seize power at any opportunity, and were just generally untrustworthy. So we've talked about industry, let's discuss now what the plans were for agriculture. Growth in cereal production was targeted at around 5.3% per year, which was very high considering China's status as a subsistence economy, but was partially based on the optimism of the previous two years, which had seen grain production increase by 11.5%. No significant extra investment was allocated to the farming industry. Instead, agricultural surplus was to be generated through the creation of more efficient peasant farming by switching from the current mutual aid team setup to Agricultural Producers Cooperatives, or APCs. Just in case I forgot to cover this in an earlier episode, Mutual Aid Teams, or MATs, were voluntary organisations made up of around a dozen or so peasant households, where everyone basically just pulled together and shared labour and tools and animals, and then they all took turns to work on each other's lands, but got to keep ownership of both the land and whatever that land produced. It was initially voluntary, but by 1953 it was made mandatory in preparation for the swap to APCs. Just a quick side note as well, I read this very good autobiographical book called Song of Praise for a Flower, where the author talks about how forming these mats was actually very political, because again, if you remember, during the land reform campaign, everyone was given like a social ranking from landlord down to poor peasant, and nobody wanted to be with the landlords because they were like the black classes, But everybody wanted to be with the middle peasants because they got the most land. But in areas where they were still super traditional, all the landlords sort of like clubbed together and they refused to be with the poor peasants. And it was actually partly based on uh, Confucian tradition as well as this sort of new hierarchy that had been introduced. Anyway, it's quite interesting. So you should read the book as it goes way more in depth into the effects of these policies on individuals and families especially those who had been sort of wrongly categorised or who couldn't really rely on other family members to put them in good stead with the party. Cooperatives were seen as the most efficient and effective method of arranging peasant farmers, and the original target for cooperatives was 20% of all households by 1957. Why exactly were cooperatives favoured over mutual aid teams? Well, in two speeches on cooperatives given by Mao in October and November of 1953, these were the main reasons. Quote, Big cooperatives can eliminate the need of some peasants to rent out land, for a big cooperative of one or two hundred households can solve the problem by taking in households of widows, orphans and others not provided for. If you can't set up a cooperative, try a medium-sized one. If you can't set up a medium-sized one, try a small one but go for a medium-sized or big cooperative wherever possible. A cooperative of one or two hundred households is big, 
but a cooperative of even three or four hundred is also possible. In developing cooperatives, we should strive for quantity, quality and economy. Our final objective is to produce more grain, cotton, sugarcane, vegetables and so on. There will be no way out unless grain production is increased, otherwise neither the state nor the people will benefit. Nor will there be any way out unless more vegetables are produced in the suburbs. Since the outlying districts of the cities have rich soil and flat farmlands, which moreover are publicly owned, big cooperatives may be set up there first. Over 32,000 cooperatives are to be set up this winter and next spring, and right up to the time of the autumn harvest. By 1957, the number will have reached 700,000. But a sudden increase at one time or another should be expected, and the number of cooperatives may rise to a million, or perhaps more. So from this very heavily paraphrased excerpt, we can note a few things. Firstly, if cooperatives were to contain hundreds of households, that meant that they would stretch over at least a few villages, perhaps over five in areas where villages were sparse and widely spaced apart. Second, the first priority was increasing grain production, and the second priority was foodstuffs like vegetables for urban workers. And thirdly, there was a target for the number of cooperatives to be created by the end of the plan generally, and we'll discuss a little bit later what happened to that target. Okay, So now we understand all the whys and hows of the five-year plan, the big question is, did the plan actually work? As usual, because it would not be an episode of this podcast if this was not the case, the answer is both yes and no. So the plan worked in that the things that the party wanted to happen happened, agricultural output increased and provided a surplus to industrial production, which also increased. The problem was that the increase was not as much as the CCP wanted, which meant that from their perspective, the whole thing basically had to be thrown straight into the trash. But before we evaluate its major flaws and failures, let's go over the successes of the first five-year plan and just try to enjoy those for a moment. Grain output increased slowly but surely, rising by 2.5% in 1953 and 1.6% in 1954. Industrial output far outstripped targets, more than doubling overall throughout the plan, with an average annual growth rate of 16%. Steel production quadrupled, and coal production rose by about 98%. Wages for those working in industry rose by 40%, well above inflation, and peasant income rose by about a fifth. The slowest area of industrial growth was in light industry, which reflected the relatively low levels of investment in agriculture, which provided raw materials for textiles and food processing, but it still managed to hit a growth rate of 83%. The number of urban areas and officially designated cities also rose dramatically to accommodate the rise in urban workers. The number of official cities in China in 1949 was 132, with a total non-agricultural population of 27.4 million people. Non-agricultural population being those people whose official residence was in the city, whereas agricultural urban population was people whose official residence was in the countryside but who were in the city to work. The number of cities had risen to 153 by the end of 1952, at which point the State Financial Commission held a symposium on urban development to discuss the plans for urban planning, including the administration of new cities, the provision of services and the development of local urban economies to focus on heavy industry. These plans were then implemented during the first five-year plan in order to support the growth in the industrial sector, leading to the creation of 21 new cities and an increase in urban population of around 50% between 1953 and 1957. Most of these new cities were in resource-rich provinces such as Anhui, Heilongjiang and Henan, and there was even one built in Inner Mongolia. Almost half of them were built in areas that had no prior settlement whatsoever demonstrating the importance of proximity to resources as a central issue of urban development. The shift in the development of China's deprived rural areas into industrial powerhouses shows the commitment of the CCP to bringing China's entire economy into the modern age. In 1952, the eastern region, with 14% of the total area and 42.3% of the population, produced 68% of the total industrial output. To counteract this imbalance, during the first five-year plan, 68% of investment went to the interior and new industrial bases were developed in cities such as Xi'an, Taiyuan, Baotou, Chengdu and Wuhan, 
and in general, gaps of industrial production between the central and western parts of China and the eastern parts of China decreased sharply in the period until 1957. For a short period of time, the eastern coastal areas of China, from Guangdong all the way up to Heilongjiang, actually declined in status, while interior bases dominated both the industrial and investment economy. Though the coastal cities ended up regaining their dominance after the 1960s and especially after the 1980s, at the time it was a testament to the parties and specifically Mao's commitment to equity in China's social and economic development. One example of a dramatic turnaround in development of an inland city can be seen in Xi'an. The capital of Shanxi province and historically the ending point of the Silk Road, Xi'an was the largest city in the world during the Tang Dynasty from the 7th till the 10th centuries and is also home to the famous terracotta warriors commissioned by the first emperor of China in the 3rd century BC. By the 1950s, however, Xi'an was a backwater with a population of around 380,000 with no modern facilities, no public water supply or public transport, and only a small handicraft industry contained within about 14 square kilometres of developed land. This changed in 1953, when 17 of the 156 major industrial projects to be carried out with the help of the USSR were granted to Xi'an, focusing on the textile, electronics and ammunition industries. The plan was drawn up by the central government with the help of Soviet advisers, which planned everything from the number of non-industrial buildings to the number of people allocated to live in the city. Zones were created for education, housing, culture, industry, administration and commerce, all designed with maximum efficiency so that raw materials from one industry could be transported to the other just next door and so that patterns of life would flow in accordance with zoned areas, with people moving from factory accommodation to factory floor quickly and easily. Though there were some problems of overcrowding and pollution, the Le Corbusier levels of anal planning and indifference to pre-existing cultural and social sites and patterns of life were signs of triumph for the modern Chinese city. Also, if you don't know who Le Corbusier is, please look him up for your own entertainment more than for anything else. The five-year plan wasn't just a success in terms of economic indicators either. Life expectancy increased from 36 in 1950 to 57 in 1957, and enrolment in primary schools jumped from 25% to 50% in the same period. For those living in urban centres, quality of life began to change dramatically. The development of the iron rice bowl system meant that workers were not only guaranteed jobs for life, but they were also allocated housing, food and even clothing, and their families were guaranteed access to education and healthcare. This system removed the power of hiring and firing from individual managers who were concerned more with the targets of their own factory, putting that power into the hands of central planners, who also took pains to retrain managers, usually from the bourgeois classes, in proper socialist ideology. Though this system was often inefficient at the level of individual factory or enterprise, the logic was that it had overall net benefits for the nationwide economy. In a 2001 article, Feng Ho Lup argues that the CCP were aware of the problems of full-scale employment, but considered political stability and long-term economic planning more important than the transitory problems such as individual business failures or the decline in one industry, leading to the need to retrain large numbers of workers. So overall, the five-year plan had actually been a great success in terms of allowing China to begin forging its own path on the way to modernization, using the knowledge and technical expertise of the Soviet Union to help them, and adapting that knowledge to their own unique circumstances. The fact that any growth at all was achieved was actually really remarkable. When the Soviet Union first launched their first five-year plan, the grain output shrank dramatically. However, despite these evident successes, there were many perceived problems with the first five-year plan. I want to highlight just one particular occurrence that kind of explains why, instead of maintaining this slow but steady consistent growth, the Chinese leadership and Mao specifically made certain decisions that ended up devastating the Chinese economy and society for decades to come. It's important that at this point we sort of see fiscal planning and the direction of the planned economy in the 1950s as hinging on Mao's opinions and preferences, which could change drastically and did change drastically all throughout the mid-1950s. So in 1953, growth in grain output ended up being well below the projected 9%. 
as I mentioned before, it was around 2.5%, which in turn restricted the growth of industry as it relied on the raw materials from the agricultural sector, as well as grain to feed its workers. The state had fundamentally neglected the link between agriculture and industry, despite the fact that this relationship formed the entire basis of the five-year plan. They sort of just assumed that output would increase despite the complete lack of investment, and then they were shocked to find that there was actually a grain supply shortage in 1953 and 1954, especially as the majority of peasants opted to sell grain on the private market, which gave them better prices than state procurement. The government couldn't raise the price of grain sold in urban areas due to their commitment to feed all workers affordably, and the thought of reducing the scale and pace of industrialization to meet agricultural output levels was simply unthinkable. Eventually, the state just basically banned the private sale of grain, turning all markets into state-owned procurement agencies, and the pace of cooperativization was increased in order to increase state control over production and delivery. Peasant farmers were basically forced to join during what was known as the high tide of socialism from mid-1955 onwards, when Mao criticised the slow pace of reforms. In 1954, only 2% of households had joined cooperatives. That number had reached 98% by the end of 1956. But this consolidation of farming households into APCs did not boost grain production as much as the central leadership had hoped. Some senior party leaders, including Liu Xiaoqi and another infrequently mentioned guy named Deng Zihui, who was important in the 40s and 50s but is not important after then, had called for the slowing down and even the disbandment of many APCs, especially where they had been formed too hastily and peasants had been coerced into joining. But Mao continued to argue that APCs were not just important economically but also politically, as they prevented the re-emergence of class divides in the countryside and eventually he just denounced both Deng and Liu Xiaoqi in 1955, accusing them of rightist deviation and demanding that all new plans and documents had to be passed through him before being sent out by the Central Committee. So this is where we start to get the sort of Mao as supreme leader and the only person who is allowed to have an opinion or do any thinking emerge. Though in the end, grain output rose 3.7% and cotton rose by 4.7%, and both of these actually exceeded the final targets that were set for them in 1955, these results were ultimately disappointing to the Chinese government. So apart from these internal disputes, the CCP also blamed a lot of the lack of success of the first five-year plan on the Soviet Union, which became evident in the speech given by Mao in April 1956, titled On the Ten Major Relationships. In the introduction to this speech, Mao says, quote, there are some problems in our work that need discussion. Particularly worthy of attention is the fact that in the Soviet Union, certain defects and errors that occurred in the course of their building socialism have lately come to light. Do you want to follow the detours they have made? It was by drawing lessons from their experience that we were able to avoid certain detours in the past, and there is all the more reason for us to do so now. End quote. The defects and errors he is referring to here were that the Soviet style just basically wasn't that compatible with the state that China was in at the time. Like I said earlier, the Chinese were basically relying on sheer willpower to get them through and achieve most of their targets, but even with 20,000 Soviet advisors in the country, growth just wasn't at the levels that they wanted. Despite the fact that industrial growth actually exceeded targets, the Chinese also very quickly fell out of love with the managerial systems that they had inherited from the Soviet Union, Lots of people felt that the Soviet advisors were like super overbearing and would deliberately mess up some of the uh, plans or installations just so that they could redesign it from scratch themselves. The Soviet Union also introduced systems such as strict hierarchies with one man managerial style leadership that caused infighting and sabotage, and an incentives plan that caused competition, people covering up their mistakes and also the practice of lowering production targets so that they were easier to achieve, and therefore the incentives were easier to get. So throw on top of this Khrushchev's secret speech, which he delivered in February 1956, in which he denounced Stalin and his cult of personality, and began the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union, and you basically have the beginnings of the Sino-Soviet split, which wouldn't be fully realised until the 1960s. 
But 1956 signalled a definite shift from the centralised bureaucratic planning to a more localised managerial system that was a bit more flexible and encouraged managers to be more red than expert. Red indicating people's level of communism and expert indicating people's educational and technical expertise. So this move established the dominance of politics in economic production, just in time for the Great Leap Forward, which took place in 1958. However, the debate between a balanced approach to development and the big push strategy that Mao had been supporting since the beginning of the first five-year plan raged continually and was not to be solved until major events in 1956 and 1957 ultimately forced Mao's hand. In the last section of his speech on the 10 major relationships, Mao described the Chinese nation as follows, quote, We are first poor and second blank. By poor, I mean we do not have much industry and our agriculture is underdeveloped. By blank, I mean that we are like a blank sheet of paper and our cultural and scientific level is not high. From a developmental point of view, this is not bad. The poor want revolution, whereas it is difficult for the rich to want revolution. Countries with a high scientific and technological level are overblown with arrogance. We are like a blank sheet of paper, which is good for writing on. End quote. China was so backwards, so underdeveloped, and so in need of revolution that anything could and should be tried to pull it up to the level of a modern industrial nation. On this blank sheet of paper, one could write anything at all, no matter how outrageous, and it would be attempted at any cost. Unfortunately, as we'll see in later episodes, something drastically outrageous was tried, and the cost was very high indeed. Okay, so that's it for this episode, guys. I cannot believe the amount of times I've said the words industry and agriculture in this episode, but that is just the way that it goes sometimes. Don't forget that you can sign up for email alerts on the Sinobabble website, letting you know every time a new episode is released, along with some fun or interesting reading for the week. You can also donate to support the podcast by going to the website and clicking on the donate button. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you tune in next time.